Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, uh, I'll begin by just thanking the Social Science and Humanities Research Council, or SHARC, for um, supporting this talk today, and uh, PhD candidate Alexi Orchard, who is also the the lab tech of the Critical Media Lab, who set up the, the webinar. So thanks, Alexi. Um, of course, uh, I should give a land acknowledgement. So our, our guest today, very quickly, our guest today is Suzanne Kite. And Suzanne, if you get email from anyone at this university, odds are at the bottom of the message, you will see this land acknowledgement, which says, I acknowledge that I work and teach on the traditional territory of the Attawandaran, Anishinaabeg, and Haudenosaunee peoples. University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman track, land promised and given to six nations, which includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Um, I don't even think it's enough to just this thing. It's so rote. And what I really am, what I really love today about our guest speaker is that she gives us another way of understanding our land acknowledgement because our university is on unceded land, but our university also uses an inordinate uses up an inordinate amount of tech resources because we are very much a tech university. And that, you know, those resources require, for example, extracting materials from the land. And so I'm just going to quickly read this quote from the article that uh, is inspired the title of this talk today. So this is from uh, Suzanne's article, how to build uh, how to build anything ethically. So it goes, extracting materials in a good way requires transparency, regulation, and research into developing physical computing devices which do not use a single new material and eventually do not require mined materials at all. The refining of many elements which are mined, rocks, metals, minerals, etc., produces toxic and non-recyclable waste. What is being offered to the earth when we extract these mined minerals? What is being offered to those whose lands are being extracted from? For our human kin, we can start with fair wages. For our non-human kin, it is the repair of the earth back to a healthy state. So that's enough. That's enough out of me, but that should maybe inspire a little bit of an introduction to Dr. Suzanne Kite, who's an award-winning Oglala Lakota artist, composer, and academic. Her scholarship and practice explore contemporary Lakota ontology, the study of beinghood in Lakota, artificial intelligence, and contemporary art and performance. She creates interfaces and arranges software systems that engage the whole body in order to imagine new ethical AI protocols that interrogate past, present, and future Lakota philosophies. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Suzanne Kite. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right. Uh, make this bigger for myself. There we go. Um, so stop me at any time if, if you can't hear something or or if my internet's going funny. Uh, so, uh, um, um, Oglala Hamacha Chante Washte Nape Tuzipo. Um, so, um, my name is Dr. Suzanne Kite. I live on the lands of the Mohicaniac, uh, peoples. We, um, we live here on the, uh, in the Hudson Valley. Uh, currently I'm the long title. I'm the distinguished artist in residence in studio arts. Uh, at Bard College and an assistant professor in American Indigenous Studies at Bard College and the director of the Wahanli Sa'a or Dreamer Lab at Bard. Um, so just to give some context, if you're not familiar with Lakota, Lakota peoples, uh, this is uh, in the center-ish of the United States. Um, my folks live in the southwest corner of South Dakota. But as um, you can see, the unceded Sioux territory, also promised through treaties, is, is a lot larger than, than these um, uh, war camps that we still, um, that a lot of my family still lives in. Um, to be very specific, uh, and I always like to ask people in conversation and in students to think about, you know, what 
um, mountain was close by where they grew up or what what river or body of water is close by where they call they think of as home. And for me, uh, my family um, is still very much living around my great grandmother's home in uh, South Dakota and near a place called Kyle Dam and a little creek called No Flesh Creek. And to be super specific, when I do my research, it's uh, I have a much larger family than this, but these are some of the main people that I think about and I work with their stories and, and their um, contributions, especially my cousin, Corey Stover. Um, so today we're talking about this, how to build anything ethically section of the indigenous protocols and in artificial intelligence position paper. And this was written very specifically um, through phone calls with uh, my aunt, uh, Melita Stover, Janice in the center here and next to my other aunt, Naomi. And, um, you know, the, my aunts aren't, don't have doctorates. Um, they did not go to university, but they are extreme experts in things that I'm not an extreme expert in, in cultural knowledge and in um, uh, Lakota philosophy. So I really spent a lot of time working with my cousin, Corey here, uh, who's also quoted heavily in this paper. Uh, so just a background about why I'm doing AI ethics work when I'm an artist. And that's because when I started making work in, um, in my undergrad, I went to CalArts. I was really focused on making body interfaces. I was a composer and a classical violinist and a klezmer violinist too, actually. And then I was wanted to build um, interfaces to be worn on the body. And I really wasn't happy with the kind of one-to-one -one interactions that I was experiencing. Um, you know, I could create loose interactions. This is the first interface I've, I had built by uh, my collaborator, James Hurwitz um, in, in 2014, but um, I wanted to figure out how to complicate my relationship with the computer during live performance. So of course, machine learning emerged as a possibility around that time, the Wekinator system. And that's kind of the way my practice goes now. I, I work on body interfaces, hair braid interfaces, um, et cetera. Uh, the first machine learning work I made was in uh, 2018 called Listener. And, and this led to questions about why and how I could use artificial intelligence tools, uh, machine learning tools, data tools, computational media, um, and how it could be connected to Lakota philosophy uh, when it's so deeply unethical materially on a very material level. And also on a philosophical level, the, the, uh, uh, the philosophies and ontologies, so the understandings of who's a being in the ontologies that lead to computer parts, are so vastly different than the ontologies that lead to Lakota decision-making um, and who we make relationships with in our communities. But um, there's a this uh, English colloquialism in our communities called the good way is uh, defined sort of for me as, depending on where you're coming from, for me, it's the Lakota road of ethical decision-making, the good way. Um, so uh, in my research, these are, have been the core areas of focus for a while, non-human ways of being or ontologies, uh, interiority, which is a term that comes from, uh, it comes from anthropology, uh, relationality, which is, can be an art term or can be a uh, indigenous, uh, kind of pan-indigenous term um, for relating to things. Animism, of course, is an anthropology term, and then stones and their relationships to artificial intelligence. So in uh, the first paper that I wrote about this um, and the first kind of discussions I did publicly, I knew uh, that from my experiences with um, uh, other Lakota people and from just basic cer basic ceremony, that uh, we understood stones to be have beinghood that was extremely complex uh, and um, not to be flattened into easy understanding. And it occurred to me that 
the complexity that we were personifying or projecting onto artificial intelligence would be a very beautiful opening to helping non-Lakota people understand the potential beinghood of the melted stones in their computer parts as a way to access the potential um, ethics that material relationships can provide when building anything. So um, this original lecture that I wrote was called Non-Human Futures. I, I think I gave it in 2019 at uh, MIT's Zoology Symposium. And um, a lot of this work is, I, this quote very much undergirds a lot of it, is Fine Deloria Jr., who um, was a very important Dakota philosopher. He said, respect involves two attitudes. One attitude is the acceptance of self-discipline by humans in the communities to act responsibly towards other forms of life. The other attitude is to seek, seek to establish communications and covenants with other forms of life on a mutually agreeable basis. And this term covenants is kind of at the core of, of how I think about uh, relationships and potential relationships with non-human beings. AI just being one of the potential infinity of them. Uh, the other quote that's very important to me is uh, from Dylan Rainforth's How Aborigines Invented the Idea of Object-Oriented Ontology. Uh, he says, object mastery and territorial possession are demonstrably part and parcel of the processes of genocide. And so when we think about objecthood, uh, it's not so simple as to sort things into human and non-human, object and not object. Uh, it's uh, very important to consider what deeming something object or deeming something uh, not human enough to be considered human, what that does uh, to the, uh, how that leads to the disrespect of uh, resources on a vast level, uh, leading to things like environmental destruction. So if you want to read kind of the first iteration of that, that that's available but from the Journal of Design Science. Uh, and so now I'll dig in a little bit to this position paper. Um, the other person who collaborated with me on this uh, in conversation um, was my longtime collaborator, Scott Benison Abandon, who's a um, Anishinaabe uh, artist. So when I decided when I decided to flesh out a kind of a methodological exploration in this paper, I knew I needed to find a way to ground it in something that was uh, that I could knew for certain was eth was made in an ethical way. Uh, my uh, my uh, my guess when I started this out, my hypothesis was that if that methodology is a key component in making something in an ethical way. And that if I could identify how uh, people in my community made uh, something like a sweat lodge, for example, in an ethical way, it could give me a starting point to imagine uh, methodologies for new things. Uh, so I chose the sweat lodge uh, because it's kind of a, it's a very well-known and it's not like a private, a super private closed, pretty close practice, but not fully closed. Uh, people are very welcoming um, uh, into the practices, but I, of course, I'm not telling anybody in this paper how to actually build one, but kind of conceptually the methods. Uh, so I was thinking about how in order to build one, we have to apprentice first. Uh, you know, you, you have to learn from so many people in order to learn how to even begin to build something like that. Uh, so same thing with um, artificial intelligence. I imagine that if we're going to build a computing device to house an artificial intelligence, uh, a general, you know, an artificial intelligence that we project uh, some sort of humanity onto, then perhaps it would you'd need much more consultation than what happens now. Especially, I mean, think about the news this week and OpenAI, uh, the amount of complexity in fighting uh, behind um, the engineering of these things is uh, very telltale of the kind of discombobulation of 
of choice and ethics and uh, what's getting built and pushed on us aggressively. The other thing that's very important to me is the idea of need. I think a lot of the tools that uh, we are accosted with, we don't actually need and we didn't ask for it. And communities um, have needs and they should be consulted with and asked what they need before throwing something on them that actually just leads to more like consumption or there's no, I, that like uh, that leads to buying more things. I, I know that a lot of these AI tools are actually out there trying to figure out how to advertise to us better. But that's not exactly, I mean, when I um, work with students, my uh, first question in workshops is who is your community and what are their values and what does your community need? What do, what do they what do they say? They're usually screaming at the top of their lungs. We need blank. We need clean water. We need an easier way to translate. We need an easier way to teach our children our language. Um, the other thing that's very important, um, and I know people in classes have been talking about it, is the idea of stakeholders. And uh, there are lots of discussions about expanded ideas of stakeholders in data governance in the United States and, and in Canada. Um, and that is encouraging, but obviously a lot of the stakeholders that some of us consider more important than others aren't being considered. So in my community, if they're, um, uh, we have covenants with non-human beings, um, which we consider nations, like in a very political way, and if they are not considered stakeholders uh, in the mine, in mining, um, in extraction, then um, then all the stakeholders aren't accounted for. Um, so, yeah, when I think about um, currently, there's a mine that's going to be open in the Black Hills and like the most sacred part of our of Lakota world for a new uranium mine. Like we need a new uranium mine, and uh, obviously they. they they did community consultation, but I doubt they asked the non-human beings in that area um, if they if if they wanted a new uranium mine um, to go in. So, and I think about that, and I I especially think about in the computational devices that we use, and in the forced black box of not knowing where any of those materials come from. Uh, there are real people and real beings and real environments at the other end of these uh, material uh, process chains uh, who should be stakeholders in the final computing device. Um, this is of course connected with raw materials. Um, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes from uh, my cousin Corey. When we, when I were thinking about building a new sweat lodge, uh, there is some death involved, of course. We have to cut down willows in order to produce that space. Um, I have witnessed some some really, I actually, I cut, okay, this morning I cut down a, a Christmas tree and it reminded me of in the summer when I was with my family cutting down um, a tree for a ceremony. And the amount of mourning that went into that tree cutting ceremony was so intense uh, it was, so, it was so powerful. It just uh, reminded me kind of why I do what I do, that the material that um, we are taking, they, these beings, it, if we have covenants with them, if we are in discussion with them over very long periods of time, uh, they have their own families too. And not in a metaphorical way, not in like a woo way, in a very real way, where if we don't think about the effect of the family of willows. If we take too many willows, there are no willows next time. It's so basic. And I don't see why we can't apply the same logic to um, everything we use, especially if we want to, in the end, use this computing device in a good way. Um, some of the other thoughts uh, that we thought about is how the construction of something has to be done in a um, good way that assembly uh, and design and um, is all wrapped up in decision making and choice. Um, yes, yeah, preparing the internal components, each part makes a whole. Uh, and then th this is something that I've since written about a lot um, in terms of the um, idea of process or methodology or protocol in terms of song making. I think one of the most interesting 
questions in my work has that's brought me away from AI and then kind of back again is the question of uh, when we create something new as human beings, where does that creation come from? Because uh, in my experience, what I've learned from my family is that the human is not the font of knowledge that we don't, we're not this magical thing that can, that creates everything all on our own. We have to do it in collaboration with so many other beings human and non-human, we make anything on this earth and arrange it, everything comes from somewhere. And uh, that comes very much into clarity when I think about song songwriting. Uh, so make, writing a new song uh, is so, is, can be such an ethical process because it requires so little and you can use the human body um, to bring something from one place to another and then share it. Uh, similarly, I think about um, functionality and design of computational systems um, as kind of very close to this, this kind of songwriting methodology where it's in order to sing, um, all of these things have to happen in order to hear that uh, mathematically precise um, airwaves hit your eardrum. It's so complex and so amazing. And I think one of the kind of gaps in computation um, and where I think we're gonna go into another sort of computation AI winter is the disregard for the kind of depth of artistry that people could bring um, to these systems. Um, yeah, more thinking about songs and algorithm transformation, but this is, uh, super interesting to me that one of the things that I've noticed in terms of Lakota philosophy is things that are really held, uh, sacred is not the right word, but like held um, uh, known as to be precious or or mysterious, like in, the, in a very good way, unknowable, are things that transform. Uh, the human body transforms. Um, come from somewhere and then we die and something and we go somewhere major transformation uh we uh can channel things through our bodies and and create new things while we live on this earth uh and one of the things that really started to bother me i mean i make a lot of sound so thinking a lot about electronics is the if i plug in all my cables to play a really loud noise set there's always a lot of um, electronic buzz and um, feedback and stuff. What am I actually listening to? I'm actually listening to, if let's say, I, I think I made this piece when I was in Montreal. So I was thinking about uh, listening to the grid. I'm listening to the electrical grid. And that electricity comes from somewhere. It actually comes from a water source. So in the end, I'm really just listening to water, uh, massive amounts of water, uh, water that has to be protected and if we, if we still want to have electricity. And the same thing with our electronics. So if I'm trying to interact with an artificial intelligence, you know, even as simple as like a basic shallow machine learning model, I am still interacting with a natural source of power somewhere in the world, whether I'm allowed to figure out where that is or not. I actually found in a lot of these processes, we can't actually find out where our energy comes from on a day-to-day -day basis. It's like private information that the government doesn't want people to know necessarily. There's like a complex bidding process every day. But that is, uh, there's so much transformation that happens. So transformation is uh, so key to understanding and, and allowing things to still have, um, to respect unknowability. Um, announcement, uh, it's very, uh, if you've ever interacted with um, indigenous peoples, uh, feasting things and um, announcing things, naming things are extremely important because it says, it says who takes responsibility for the thing that was created. Uh, when we make something new, uh, a lot of these companies hide behind the US, the United States is so famous for uh, corporations being treated as people until it comes time to hold somebody legally accountable for, let's say, uh, a Superfund site, which is where companies have poisoned the earth so much that it would take 
it would you could never raise enough money to make the place livable again. That becomes a super fun site. Uh, companies aren't held responsible for those things. Uh, and nobody, no humans are held responsible for those things. And so that's why I think announcement is a very important part of processes that we don't get. Um, finally, a uh, very important uh, step in creating anything is how it's going, what's gonna happen later. A lot of our materials that get mined, uh, we don't, United States, we do not have the right to repair. I actually don't remember what the status of that is in Canada, but uh, the right to repair seems like an extremely basic tenant of environmental responsibility. Um, knowing what's going to happen to materials when we're done with them is so is incredibly important. Uh, and I think, you know, Native people know this to a really clear uh, point because when you deal with museums, a lot of our, um, our, our things that were important to us were soaked in formaldehyde so they can never disintegrate. This desire for permanence is a very strange desire um, to me. Uh, things should never be permanent. We should be able to reuse them or they should be allowed to, to go back to the earth. So um, I'm a couple minutes left. I'm just gonna fly through some, some examples. Uh, this is an example of sculpture that uh, was made um, to try to work through some of these problems and think about the fit, how I couldn't make a, to make a sculpture to show exactly how I could not make it in an ethical way. Uh, this is a, one of my family's sweat lodges from a, a while back, I think probably like 2013. Um, and one of our, our stone friends. Um, these are the graphics in that position paper. I, um, I think most importantly to me and everything I just said, AI is, in my opinion, does not technically exist. Uh, I don't think anything is artificial and I think intelligence is a pretty useless term um, in the higher and to high, make hierarchies for things. Uh, intelligence is the first ter first term used to try to argue that like people of color aren't uh, aren't human enough to be respected. Intelligence is used to uh, disrespect non-human beings. Uh, intelligence is not the highest value in my community. Um, the most important quality in other human beings is probably reciprocity. So. Um, AI can be switched out for anything. It could be a conversation, it could be a song, it could be an interface, it could be an instrument. And I really encourage people to imagine making something, anything in this world uh, and all of the possible protocols that could go into doing it. So in this graphic, we have AI in the center and possible pro streams of protocol feeding into it and then zooming in on the right to some of these streams of protocol. Uh, and I really encourage people to look through this paper and do a thought exercise where they imagine a protocol stream with some with some of these questions. So I'll, I'll end by telling everybody about the grant that I'm involved with now. It's a research program called Abundant Intelligences. Uh, we have a lot of partners and we're super excited. Um, we're in our first year and uh, it's indigenous led. And we'll be conceptualizing and designing artificial intelligence based on indigenous knowledge systems. So uh, supporting indigenous sovereignty, indigenous ways of knowing rooted in communities. And so through this process, we wanna switch out this artificial term for abundance, um, really coming out of the Hawaiian um, philosophy for abundance, thinking about regeneration um, leaving more for future generations than we take, reciprocity, um, sharing and an exchange of energy between the people the people and the other beings around us, um, and generosity, so sustaining one another through giving. Uh, we have three research axes, integration, so um, integrating indigenous knowledge um, with uh, expanding and mainstream AI knowledge, imaginary, so speculative design, uh, um, art making and intelligences. So um, looking at technical challenges and uh, in machine learning as, um, as they stand now. 
Um, this is our fancy graphic for how much they're all gonna blend together. So we're not gonna separate these axes too much, but um, each of the groups is gonna focus on one of them, um, especially training, because there is a real need for capacity building in communities to do this technical work. Um, so uh, well, we're gonna be a pod-based, locally rooted uh, system uh, where people are paying knowledge holders and cultural practitioners, as well as many, many scientists, engineers, artists, um, humanists, those, et cetera. Um, yeah, um, this originally started at this protocol workshop, uh, which this paper is from. Um, I don't think I have time to do all this. Uh, sorry, but they, uh, if you'd like to read more about this um, kind of deeper research on indigenous methodologies and their applications for AI in my work, uh, my dissertation is on my website, um, focusing on these uh, developing Lakota methodologies for uh, making anything. I'm gonna skip to the end and just say a couple things about my lab at Bard College. Uh, my lab is specifically focused on uh, Lakota semiotics, so um, Lakota visual language uh, as defined by Sadie Redwing, who um, is at OCAD and uh, building new AI tools to um, interact with um, dreams um, or visions, but probably a lot of focus on sleep dreams, uh, public communication through making art and uh, publishing about uh, research creation methodologies. Um, Yep, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some public art next year in New York um, with uh, the indigenous, black and indigenous dreaming workshops through a project called Creative Time. So we're super excited about that. And yeah, I'll end here. Uh, so um, before my grandfather passed, um, I asked him once uh, about the future being dangerous, if the future was too dangerous um, for humans to, mess around with and uh, his opinion, um, he said this to me, he said, um, you know, don't worry about it. Spirits and ancestors are just there on the other side trying to help. So I think it's our responsibility to listen. Uh, so thank you for having me. Thank you, that that was incredible. I don't want you to stop. <laughs> I, and I wanna hear about all the rest of the slides, but I guess, um, <laughs> I could contact you myself later. I think that was really perfect for the students who are attending today. And um, I hope super relevant. I wanna invite the students to ask, to put some questions into the Q and A, um, but I'll start with a couple questions, Suzanne, if that's okay. Um, wow, uh, there's so much there. I, I wanna start because it's timely and you mentioned open AI. I wanna invite you to maybe say a little bit more about what you think, um, I mean, you mentioned uh, a discombobulated kind of process or system happening there that that this that the open AI events are are evidence of. Can you talk a little bit more about your thoughts on that? Just share your thoughts on that. Well, I'm going to be honest. I do not fully understand what's going on over there. Uh, I, I watched a few videos on it, and I, I'll I guess I'll haven't had time this week. <laughs> <laughs> to dig into that but I mean generally um I was just on a do I was on an, an academic couple I, I was actually in a few really interesting things about data governance last week I was I spoke at the National Congress of American Indians which is a very important political event um in the United States for all the um state and federal recognized tribes and we had a huge attendance for uh, a discussion about AI and I missed I missed it but there was another huge one about data sovereignty and people are really I think beginning to understand that uh, it, the material resource is us as, as, as humans interacting with systems and our knowledge is apparently extremely valuable and I think people are just starting to understand how valuable it is and um, the governance systems are being worked on, like I, I, I see them, but the lack of policy that actually 
addresses these things head on and, and, and with specificity is extremely lacking. And it's, and it's too slow and sometimes it's too late. And uh, the governance, our governments need to work faster um, and hopefully not sell us all out. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's how I, that's generally how I feel. The, it's really scary to leave pri private companies who are being incredibly enriched with all of our data. Yeah, there's this term, and some of the students will have read uh, this article or are familiar with the term uh, data colonialism from, uh, you might be familiar with it, from Nick Coldry and Ulysses uh, Mejas. What, I mean, the term is also a little bit questionable. So there's this idea of, well, they have the concept of data colonialism. What do you think of that term? Do you think, you know, uh, basically, the idea is that they're they're extracting resources without treating our data as terra nullius, that it's no man's land, that data can just be extracted without questioning whose it is and so on. Um, what do you think of this term? Do you think it's productive? Do you think it's useful? Well, I don't think it's a perfect term, um, but I think, I think, yeah, the, just like I said before, people are starting to understand that they are the resource being extracted and anything that helps, any term I mean, is very helpful to help people to understand what kind of gaps um, in their understanding are out there and is, is helpful. I mean, it is a helpful term to, um, one of, I just was reading the I was in a panel, a McGill uh, academic review panel about uh, current Canadian AI policy, and that term came up a lot. And there was a great um, contribution from a uh, researcher, Riley Yesno, about the kind of like the same concept of um, if none of uh, if one of us isn't free, none of us are free. That sort of uh, idea that if one person can be uh, disrespected or, or not seen as fully human then, then nobody can, um, that anybody is, um, it's possible for anybody. Uh, I feel that same way about um, the, the fight that people of color, people who are who experience oppression are, are leading in AI and data governance and data sovereignty, because we know that Indigenous communities, Black communities are going to be affected the worst by uh, bias and, and outright oppression um, through data. And so, yeah, thankfully, people are leading that cause because other people's data is also at risk of being used yeah. against them. Yeah, it seems to to work that way. And you you know, you spoke a little bit about the sort of um, the power that uh, the big tech has, big tech developers have and the, the complete um, uh, lack of symmetry that is involved and in, that they, they get to make these decisions. And we just kind of follow along, like you said earlier, you know, what are, what needs are being met? There are technologies developed that we didn't really ask for and we don't need. Um, I think that's brilliant. So I have a we have a question here. Um, regarding apprenticeship. And the question is, um, when reading How to Build Anything Ethically, I was struck by the emphasis on apprenticeship and how notions of tech disruption often sub subvert the value of apprenticeship and expertise. What you said today, it seems like this also connects to how tech disruption often disregards the needs of communities. Do you see these as connected to? So I guess um, communities, tech disruption, and uh, the idea of apprenticeship. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things about the, when I ask students about to identify who their communities are, and we have, we live in many communities simultaneously, um, but especially thinking about maybe their their family's communities and their family's values and their um, maybe grandparents' values or great-grandparents' values. And while some of them we don't, we want to leave behind, some of my <laughs> grandparents didn't have great, you know, uh, you know, didn't value women the way I would want them to. 
Uh, but if we look further back, I, I mean, one of the things that comes up for me is that there is a very intense emphasis on the knowledge of elders. And I found in working with elders that the older the person is, the more creative they can think. Uh, the, the easier it is to talk uh, through AI and non-human beinghood with them. And it's the younger people actually who have such rigid concepts of beinghood. Um, I I'm, don't know exactly why that is, but I think that, that we see that misalignment of our community's values from the way tech operates um, kind of really clearly in that disregard for uh, that this, you know, one of Google's values, if you look at these companies' values, is is what it faster is better. I've never, in no other place, uh, would someone say that uh, faster is absolutely not better. Like bull in a china closet. Like the idea of um, of community of informed consent. It takes forever to do from informed consent. And why does it take forever? Because good, because good things and good ways are slow. Um, and I, I think that's all very tied up in the same misalignment of, of our values, uh, indigenous or not, and, um, and the way things get built and governed. That is a great segue to the next question. And, you know, as we know around here, there's definitely an attitude that uh, reflecting too much on technology gums up the works. You know, you you have to, it's a cult of the new. You have to constantly produce new stuff. Um, it, that's how the economy works, right? So this question, this question is um, given the points mentioned, at what point, what, what point do we let data sovereignty be a potential hindrance for technological advancement and the potential benefits that arise from them. So you can kind of see where this question is coming from. Um, I don't know if you could answer that question. Maybe you can <laughs> respond to the place that question is coming from, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I understand, like I, I'm, you know, I'm in the art world with the same problem. I have to make something new like every other day, every week in order to keep up with uh, demand. Um, and it's it's a question of, uh, do we want good things or do we want to harm people and then try to fix it later? Mm-hmm. Because fixing it later never seems to work. Um, you know, I, I, I actually think a lot about how artificial intelligence, um, is how it's connected process wise and thought wise to uranium and, uh, nuclear, uh, warfare. I, I think that there, there is a clear connection between technology development, um, uh, both types of technology development. And we know that the most that the most aggressive technological advancements are for war. That is that's how tech works. Personally, it, I do not want to use things that are that are built to kill. That's not how I, that's not using AI or making AI in a good way. That's a bad, that's the bad, it's obviously not what we want to be doing. Um, you know, I think one of the most important early uh, um, kind of native tech uh, pieces is this Lawrence Paul Yuckton piece that was an, I think one of the first VR works ever made in the 90s. And it was the technology came straight from uh military technology and that was the first one of the first vr artworks um and the his first impulse was to make uh a where you could enter into the vr and have and go to a ceremony so it's like jumping to the most intense possible use of it immediately and i think that's that i feel very much in alignment with that new media indigenous new media 
experimentation um, and that I always feel like artists have a really great impulse to disrupting this idea of what kind of benefits our communities want. Because in the end, faster is not better. <laughs> do you struggle with, do you struggle with that? I mean, you, you're obviously um, a, uh, you're, you're, you're techno critical, let's say uh, a vocal critic of, of uh, big tech. And yet you embrace, you use AI and physical computing in your artwork and you draw on all those technologies. Just do, do you ever find yourself thinking, you know, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? What, you know, is it difficult for you or do you do you have some uh, secret for managing that discord? Well, actually, I really um, I really separate my practice into critical stuff um, and generative. So, you know, the work that I'm working on, like with Alicia Wormsley and the Black and Indigenous Dreaming and, um, you know, thinking about I mean, most of my artwork comes from trying to find very Lakota methodologies for making something new. I'm very interested in making new things with these specific methodologies and um, and demonstrating that new covenants can be made. We already know how to make covenants with non-human beings in our communities. Uh, you know, we can make eth new ethical covenants with non-human beings that that are that are seemingly new. Um, we know how to work with things that are complex and difficult in ethical ways. And uh, we, I think, myself and my fifty-plus research associates on the Abundant Intelligence Grant are all working at doing that in a clear way to show that it's not um, necessary to only think critical pure critically but to come from a place of creating something new with values of reciprocity it is possible um and people are have already done it and like i'm not you know there's amazing projects coming out of um, all of our uh, research associates i really like that because it also balances critique with uh with creativity and with joy um that there can be possibly some room for joy in this uh, we did have a question just just here for anyone who's out there wondering, yes, this will be recorded and available from the website of the Critical Media Lab. Uh, I have so many more questions I want to ask Suzanne, re especially regarding the more than human, the non-human, and the way that you know the word human is thrown around in discussions of AI right now. But I'll just I'll ask you one last question, which may be a loaded question. Do you agree with AI doomsayers that the path we're on with AI right now could lead to the end, uh, to the demise of humanity as it's being put. Actually, I was just thinking about, um, I always think about this when the doomy questions come up in uh, panels and stuff, because um, I think I read some, like when the telephone was invented, all of the, how the, the, the world was gonna come to an end because of the evils of the telephone. Um, which always cracks me up because uh, it sounds the exact same to me um, that uh, the world, the humanity, is, if humanity comes to end, it will definitely be humanity's fault. Uh, if uh, humanity does a good job um, with its technologies and helps each other, then, then humanity will have done that. Um, though uh, it's very clear that just like with the mining of uranium, uh, we have clear responsibilities uh, and our governments and our, our systems of governance have responsibilities to us as human beings and to the world we live in. And if people don't, of, of course, I mean, if we look at, I don't know, that it's such a, I think I, I'm kind of on board with the idea that doom thoughts are uh, cop outs for not taking responsibility um, for things. And I think that when I spend time with my community, we're, you know, for as 
impoverished and struggling as they are, they're extremely optimistic, positive people, you know? Um, and so I, I used to be very in this dystopian uh, centered idea of the future is so bleak. Um, and how could I even think or dream about the future when people are suffering so much right now? But I actually am so encouraged by my students and the, and the materials um, and, and art making. And um, I know that, you know, our community, my community has experienced lots of loss where uh, and lots of communities feel this where even um, especially uh, it, um, people experience migration and they're, they've, um, they feel like they've lost cultural uh, grounding um, and it's difficult to make new things because they don't feel culturally grounded. But um, even with extreme loss of knowledge, that's what dreams and that's why I'm so interested in that kind of the way songs come through the body is no matter what, no matter what uh, is lost, we have the ability to make new things um, and that computers were literally just invented. They're not the, the, the way they are now is absolutely not the way they're even be in 10 years. And so we have ample opportunity to make them better. It's, it's not like they're going to stay the same way for, I mean, think about the telephone, the telephone as we knew it 30 years ago is over. Yeah. <laughs> I, I sometimes think the doom saying is just really good marketing for 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 AI developers who already hold the power want to keep it. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for all of this. Uh, best discussion of AI maybe I've ever heard, to be honest. <laughs> wow. And uh, I want to thank you. I hope everyone out there will thank you too for your time today. And uh, I will follow up with you. And uh, I, that's it. Just thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye, everyone.